This episode is sponsored by Dashlane. Civilization has collapsed. The only rational way forward is to cover your dune buggy with spikes, craft some leather S&M armor, and resort to cannibalism. Mohawks are optional. A pretty common theme in science fiction, and just in general discussion of the future, is that some sort of doomsday will occur that will leave only shadowed remnants of civilization behind. Often shadowed not just physically, but spiritually too. Typically that remnant left behind is portrayed as crazy cannibal barbarians. Even the nominal heroes of such stories tend to be nihilistic, and more than a trifle villainous in portrayal. There is some logic in that notion too. We get the word apocalypse from the Greek word for revelation, the last book of the New Testament, that has the various survivors on earth being those left behind after all the good folks got a ticket to paradise. And a lot of stories set in such scenarios will have similar notions in play. Something has made a lot of folks crazy or evil and that's part of why civilization isn't rebuilding itself to rise from the ashes like a phoenix. This has some plausibility since technological civilizations are hard to trash by simple disasters, so something generally has to be making them act weird in the first place, otherwise the disaster, natural or artificial, is either going to kill everyone off or be something we recover from after a while. Of course, a while is a pretty relative term. We can dismiss it as irrelevant when talking about things like galactic colonization and the Fermi Paradox because several centuries just doesn't mean anything on those timelines. But this episode is in our Rogue Civilization series, and our prior two examples, space prison colonies and techno-primitivism, were both cases where they seemed like temporary states of civilization. Cultures are constantly changing, so it seems wrong to bypass one that would tend to be fairly temporary just lasting a handful of generations, since again, most cultures don't even last that long. We could contrive some particular doomsday scenario that made a post-apocalyptic civilization linger in a diminished state a very long time, but while I was considering more plausible options for that, it got me wondering about what would survive afterwards. For instance, we tend to picture tribes of leather-clad mutants with mohawks riding around on dune buggies in a wasteland, something that got so cliche in fictional post-apocalypses that a lot of shows satirize it like Rick and Morty, but it raises the question about where they get the gasoline for those engines. Gasoline does not actually store well, even if water and oxygen don't seep in, The gas itself will separate into light volatiles and a sludge of heavier viscous compounds. You'd have problems getting it to work in an engine a year later, even if it's been stored properly, which is unlikely to be the case in most doomsday scenarios. And even very good storage and a fuel stabilizer might only get you two or three years. Gasoline's not terribly hard to make, but a cracking tower isn't something you'd expect your typical tribe of mutants to have. And you can't just find an abandoned one and dump in some crude oil or spoiled fuel and fire it up. Well, you might be able to, but firing it up is probably exactly what would happen. So if you got folks with functioning engines decades after Doomsday, it implies they've got folks who are decent chemists and engineers, or at least repairmen, and who have time to practice their trade, so your savage tribe of mutants won't be staying primitive much longer. Otherwise, if they want those high horsepower dune buggies, they need to be pulled by actual horses, which kind of ruins the flavor. The Mohawks are fine at least, hail gel and cutting technology doesn't need to be very advanced to do that one. The leather is probably fine too, except one wouldn't really expect a lot of cows or deer to be around the typical irradiated wasteland. Of course it's often implied to be made from other people though rats seem more likely and economically plausible. Cannibalism, literal or figurative, is not a winning pathway, especially for humans who need decades to grow up. The math just doesn't work out. Cannibalism will certainly happen in desperate times, but given that humans need decades to reach full size, a food industry based on it would be impractical. Of course they have to get close from somewhere, and textile factories wouldn't seem to be common so fur and hide would make sense, 
but there would be a ton of clothing left over from the end of the world. Properly stored, most fabrics do hoard up for generations, but they'd be getting worn out from being worn out in the wasteland, and leftovers lying around ruined warehouses, basements, and attics would tend to get moldy and picked apart. The most enduring would presumably be polyester, so amusingly, the mutant savages are more likely to look like they escaped from a disco than a biker ball. You're probably thinking leather is better for absorbing strikes, as is chainmail, but keep in mind there are millions of Kevlar vests in the US alone, and while the ballistic plates would all break, Kevlar lasts and can be patched, and you could stick a piece of sheet metal in one as a decent replacement for the ceramic plate, which is for bullets not knives anyway. Coming up with rubber for boot soles would be unlikely though, so they'd probably have to go back to wood and hobnails though maybe they could use sheets of plastic or metal in hobnails. As to those various ruined houses, even absent any new production, when the plant's been reduced to scattered millions instead of billions, you've got spare parts and replacements all over the place, slowly rusting down in many cases. A prolonged scavenger punk era wouldn't be likely, at least where durable consumables are concerned since they'd know where every building was and would either have quickly ransacked all their supplies, or, if they are few in number, have stopped only because they had acquired more than they could use before spoilage. People will be getting pretty systematic about it, someone will think to grab or make maps and document each building looted, and to use things like fiber optic snake cameras for scoping out collapsed structures. If not, it's because there are very few people in which case they will have more than enough supplies by ransacking the local grocery store and warehouses, leaving them tons of time to prepare for when their supplies go bad, rather than get used up. The scavenger aspect of fighting over supplies only applies when there's high demand but limited quantities, not when there's a huge supply with a half-life. The more enduring stuff is going to be things like stainless steel cookware and utensils, as well as granite countertops so the mutants probably won't be cooking over an oil barrel with rusty pots, rather they are going to have very ornate and top-notch kitchens to prepare their rat-based cuisine in. Things like knives are going to be around half of forever anyway, and there's no shortage of metal to work with either. Of course we tend to assume all those electric appliances in the kitchens would be worthless, but while gas-powered vehicle engines would be a pain to fuel after the first couple of years, A stationary electric generator is actually really easy to build and maintain, especially if efficiency and mobility isn't too big a deal, as you can use rather crude parts. So you'd actually expect them only to stop having electricity when all the things that used it eventually broke down, and that will take centuries since a lot of appliances are incredibly useful and rugged, especially if not used a lot, like sewing machines, LED light bulbs, food processors, clocks, and so on. In the same vein, batteries won't last long, but battery-powered things can, and batteries are fairly simple to make and can be built out of lots of stuff that's lying around like copper pennies, or easily made even by Copper Age civilizations. A good lead-acid battery takes a bit more work, but not a lot. Size and weight are a different matter when it comes to batteries, and those post-apocalyptic muscle-bound freaks we see in the movies probably got that way lugging around insanely heavy batteries for their portable equipment. We also always assume such folks would go back to a barter culture when not stealing anyway, but while paper money wouldn't last long, all those trillions of coins lying around the planet would make a handy medium of exchange, being rather durable and hard to forge, so I'd not be surprised if they just kept on using the local coinage albeit massively deflated in value so a penny or nickel was valuable enough again to make it worth carrying, not for its intrinsic metal value, but just because it's already viewed as money, and again is tricky to make forgeries of without the right equipment. Gunpowder is easy enough to make, as are bullets. Guns themselves are pretty durable and most of the less durable parts can be jury rigged, even a lot of the more fragile bits like the springs in your typical magazine or magazine catch button. Those do regularly appear in post-apocalyptic settings, what's missing is that most would probably have working flashlights and scopes attached to them too, 
and their wielders all likely have perfectly modern body armor to go with them, not just dirty leather or rusty knives. They probably won't be terribly dirty either, they're unlikely to just magically forget that many ailments are attached to not keeping clean, soap is easy to make, and contrary to popular belief, our pre-industrial ancestors never had an aversion to bathing. When they didn't do it a lot, it was because they just lacked the facilities and fuel to make it convenient, and our post-apocalyptic civilizations will remember hygiene's importance to disease control and be even more likely to emphasize it. A collapsed civilization isn't one that just goes back in time like someone flipped the calendar back. A ton of technologies are really easy to do once you think them up, and often folks incorrectly assume that if something was invented in, say, the late 19th century, that it must require all the technology and industrial resources of that period to make or maintain them. The standard gem paperclip is from that era, but anybody with a length of wire can obviously make them. You don't picture the mutant tribes brushing their teeth either, but a toothbrush is an easy enough device and they won't have forgotten the value of that or what causes wounds to get infected or a host of other things it took us a long time to learn but are easy enough to know. They might run out of canned foods in a decade or so as all get scavenged or go bad, but they won't forget how and why we can food. Similarly, there's many other ways to make a refrigerator, freezer, or air conditioner than our typical modern models, like the Einstein fridge that has no moving parts and just needs piping, fire, and some refrigerant to work, even ammonia or alcohol does the trick. But even the normal designs could be maintained, repaired, and cannibalized for a very long time, and anyone working on them is going to develop an understanding of them quickly enough. So the mutant tribes would have freezers for storing their food too, and we would doubt that only because we think of them as hunter-gatherer equivalents, and such folks walked everywhere they went and so would need to carry stuff too. But they wouldn't be, because they wouldn't be hunter-gatherers, they might have to walk, or use bicycles or horses, as again gasoline doesn't store well so they'd have to produce it, though they could and there's lots of alternate fuels to use including alcohol but they don't need to move where they live. Our ancestors did because their food did, the herds migrated so they migrated with them, until they domesticated them and got good at pasture management. Those critters are still domesticated and won't just revolt because the end of the world happened. They'd have tons of building materials lying around to pick from, many stone, brick, or concrete ones that would work well. And if their village looks like a junkyard, it's probably just because those would be so valuable for spare parts they might live there to maintain possession of it. But they don't have to move because they can still grow food. There's the notion that they live in a barren wasteland so they have to hunt or gather, but if animals and plants can live there to supply food, that means they can grow food there too. They'd have an effectively infinite supply of glass to make greenhouses out of too if water or contaminated soil was problematic. Fundamentally though, agriculture is more efficient than hunting and gathering, no matter how wrecked the local environment is, unless it's so wrecked you couldn't hunt or gather anyway because everything was dead, in which case you'd follow soon thereafter. This though highlights why we tend to regard such civilizations as rather temporary, Over and over again we see why they'd still prize knowledge, and how even in the most brutal and savage setups, they'd still benefit by preserving and utilizing it. And those were just examples off the top of my head, I'm sure you can think of many more, and I'd encourage you to put down your thoughts on the matter down in the comments below or our Facebook or Reddit groups. Just from what we've seen today though, they are likely to have a lot more luxuries and modern conveniences and advantages than we normally assume, and likely to have a lot of highly skilled technicians hanging around, even if they are sporting mohawks and dressed up in rat leather, or polyester and kevlar, and such skills are likely to be valued and lead inevitably to restoring technology and infrastructure. This is much easier if you still remember that basic science and still have books and diagrams and broken down examples of such devices to build off of. Personally, I don't think we'll ever have a post-apocalyptic civilization, either a catastrophe would make us extinct, 
or we'd recover fairly quickly, but if we do end up with one, I suspect it wouldn't be nearly as grim as we tend to think and would restore itself after only a few generations at most. I was mentioning how we'd expect electricity and appliances to remain in use even after a total collapse of civilization, and I suspect we'd see the internet, or local equivalents, pop back up pretty quick. Of course, that's assuming it wasn't the internet that brought on the apocalypse. The internet is like most technologies, it offers many benefits, but with new risks and challenges, both to civilization and to us individually. Whether or not the internet might end the world, if you do get your identity stolen or your accounts hacked, it can feel like the end of the world for you. Internet security and encryption is only as good as your password, and it is important to use different ones everywhere and not ones that are easy to remember and thus easy to hack. You could make a minor account at some small website, use your favorite user ID and password, and they get hacked and someone sells all those user IDs and passwords on the dark web. Dashlane lets you not only store all your passwords for easy but secure access across all your devices, but also provides dark web monitoring to see if you've been hit and warns you if a breached password has been used at other places, and has an automatic password changer you can use to keep even safer. This keeps you safer without costing you a lot of time and inconvenience. And Dashlane also helps with that by providing instant form and payment autofill so you're not constantly having to retype data. Plus, they offer a VPN with unlimited data storage you can use on unlimited devices, be they Android, iOS, Windows, or Mac, and a secure online storage for your sensitive files that you can access anywhere. I found Dashlane to be very easy to use with lots of beneficial features for both security and convenience, and if you'd like to try it out yourself, click on the link in the description or go to dashlane.com slash IsaacArthur to try out their premium version for free for a month, and if you use my promo code, IsaacArthur, you'll get 10% off a premium subscription. So we'll be finishing April out with a look at Matrioska shell worlds, truly immense artificial planets that allow vastly more living area than Earth does, and which Earth might one day become. Next Sunday, we will also have our monthly livestream Q&A at 4pm Eastern Time. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and we'll see you Thursday.